Rachel Oates on the 1st of October, 2020. These kinds of people who think it's worse to be called transphobic than it is to do anything transphobic, or that it's worse to be called a misogynist than it is to say misogynistic things. Like, it's ridiculous, it's not. Just, just be a good person and you won't be called these things. Rachel Oates on the 5th of April, 2022. Quote, so quick art day. I filed a defamation claim against EOT's video and YouTube agreed with me that it is in violation of the UK's defamation laws and so have restricted it from being played in the UK. The big claims in their video that I'm a serial transphobe are utterly false and are said with the intent of damaging my reputation. End quote. It's ridiculous, it's not. Just, just be a good person and you won't be called these things. This is just one piece of evidence out of many that Rachel Oates wants to ban you from seeing. Why? Well, because it draws into question her own actions, a fact we'll discuss in further detail in a second. But first, a quick content warning for the following. Transmisia, queermisia, harassment, bullying, fascism, animal abuse, and child sexual abuse. If you like our work and appreciate the research put into each video, please consider supporting the channel via Patreon. You can also support us by liking, commenting, and sharing this video on social media. Hi there, my name is Sophie Thurston, she, her, they, them, and today we'll be continuing our journey to document the impact Rachel Oates has had on the trans community, specifically how she published private emails sent to her by a trans member of her audience, emails which opened with the writer explicitly stating that he was approaching her in private because he was afraid of backlash from her audience. I repeat, Rachel Oates published emails from an audience member who was afraid of receiving backlash. That right there should have ended her career, but sadly it didn't. Which is why we're here, to get to the bottom of things. This video is the third in a five-part series, with each video documenting a key incident between Rachel Oates and the trans community. Our first video went into detail regarding the hypocrisy played at the start, comparing how Rachel Oates presents herself as an ally to the trans community versus how she actually acts. We also discussed her dishonesty in pretending like YouTube ruled on the issue when they legally cannot do so. The second video delved into the ACA split and how Rachel Oates published private information stolen from a mental health support group as part of an effort to demonize trans people, taking measures to protect themselves. So if you haven't seen those videos yet, you should go ahead and do so now, as I will be referring to them throughout this video. All of our work is fully referenced, so that you can check things for yourself. And just remember, if you're in the UK and find yourself unable to watch any of the videos in the series due to Oates's habit of weaponizing the UK's draconic defamation laws to stifle free speech, specifically criticism, you can use a VPN to get around the issue, or simply read the transcript linked in the description of each video. For the VPN, just change your country of origin to be outside of the UK, and you'll be able to access the wealth of evidence presented, allowing you to make up your own mind, something Rachel Oates would deny you. Now, there's a lot of background which is necessary for this video, both relating to Oates' own actions and Woodford's continued descent into transmisia. You can't really grasp the emails until you understand said context, so whilst I try to be as brief as possible, I need you to understand that there's just so much to cover. Starting with Rachel Oates, we need to go back a few days from where we left off in the last video, specifically to the 11th of May, which was when Woodford published a video on the whole situation, comparing herself to Galileo being judged by the Roman Inquisition. No, I still can't get over that. Naturally, I demanded to know why he was publishing videos attacking critics of his original piece before correcting his mistakes. It was during that conversation that I noted how he had failed to change the title of his original video or even acknowledge the errors in the description or a pinned comment. I also noted that he was still monetizing the video weeks after he'd returned from the US, that he was still making money off of a video calling for trans women to be stripped of six fundamental human rights. Namely, the right to equality and non-discrimination, the right to the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health, the right to sexual and reproductive health, the right to work and to the enjoyment of just and favorable conditions of work, the right to privacy, the right to freedom from torture and other cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment and harmful practices, 
and full respect for the dignity, bodily integrity, and bodily autonomy of the person. My shock and awe approach, coupled with the ACA condemnation, seemed to work. On the 12th of May, Woodford pinned an update to the original video, finally acknowledging his error at the source, even if only vaguely and in a manner that disparaged his critics. Yet, yeah, as can be seen, he was still monetizing said video and the title was the same. Those things wouldn't be changed until the 13th, as I and a few others kept putting pressure on him. Getting Woodford to do anything, let alone the right thing, really was like pulling teeth. This is why it was particularly frustrating when, in response to someone bringing up the prospect of Woodford donating the video's ad revenue, Rachel Oates asserted that he was already planning on doing so, implying that the sudden changes weren't the result of me and others calling him out on his terrible behaviour. When I asked for evidence of this, a friend of Rachel Oates, Lizzie Lang, replied by sarcastically mocking said request, before Rachel Oates joined in, adding, quote, Yep, literally what Lizzie said. Do we need to hire someone to take notes every time we have a chat now? End quote. Keep in mind that this was literally my first interaction with Oates regarding Woodford's calls to strip trans women of six fundamental human rights. Me as a skeptic asking for evidence of Woodford's intent due to his history of doing nothing, to which Oates responded by openly mocking me. Woodford had hurt a lot of people. He seemed to be doubling down by comparing himself to Galileo, and yet rather than acknowledge a very genuine request for evidence, Rachel Oates chose to mock that as unreasonable. That's how she chose to start things with me as the person who had become the de facto face of the trans community. She chose to start things with open ridicule, a fact people still refuse to acknowledge to this day. So, how did I respond, being the absolute monster I am? Well, I replied by politely stating that I liked written confirmation from the person themselves, a statement that Oates subsequently chose to ignore. And that was my last direct interaction with Rachel Oates until the 2nd of September. Don't worry, we'll get to that in the next video. Which is not to say I didn't comment on her actions, as seen in my reply to someone stating that her refusal to stand with the human rights of trans women regarding sports was a rational and thoughtful response. See the previous video on the many reasons this was flawed. Oates' interactions surrounding the trans community, the two-faced hypocrisy, the doxing of people fleeing her friend's violence, and the way she mocked me asking for evidence, didn't sit well with me. So when Woodford published his piece, Rationality Rules Debunked, on the 20th of May, in which he quite literally opens his apology by attacking his trans critics, Now if you think I'm wrong on this topic, and have a better argument than those just covered, then please do let me know, as if I'm wrong, I want to know it. It's been over a month since I expressed my views on transgender women competing in athletics, and since then, I've learned a great deal. On this note, I want to sincerely thank everyone who has reached out to me lovingly, calmly, and respectfully to point out where I went wrong. If it wasn't for your charitable listening and understanding, my views may not have changed, as if all I had received is criticisms that are prefaced with accusations of transphobia. Then, since I am not and have never been transphobic, I probably would have moved on before getting to any substance. And so, to those who were respectful, thank you. Thank you for your charitable listening. I knew I was going to have to respond, and in that response, I decided to reference my encounter with Rachel Oates. I went ahead and explained what I showed you in the previous video, noting her hypocrisy and stating that if she wants to say she doesn't know enough to stand with the human rights of trans people, then she needs to remove herself from the conversation entirely. That's to say, she needs to stop defending Woodford. I also pointed out how I, and many other trans people, had provided everything she needed to know were she actually interested in learning why Woodford's actions were so harmful. I then finished by explaining why defending human rights is the default, and that was it. That's all I said on the matter. Now, I'd actually gone ahead and blocked Rachel Oates before publishing, because she clearly wasn't arguing from a position of good faith, and I was happy leaving things that way. After all, 
she could always say whatever she wanted on her own platform. Turns out, that wasn't good enough, at least according to some people. Osa's close friend, Thomas Westbrook, also known as Holy Kool-Aid, demanded that I unblock her and platform her on my channel. Westbrook was so aggressive in demanding this that I even remarked at the time that he seemed to be under the impression that he owned me. My reply was, to put it mildly, rather vulgar. I felt he could get fucked if he thought he could tell me how to run my channel. Again, Rachel Oates was free to publish whatever she wanted to her own channel, which, considering she had over 100,000 subscribers to my 30,000, seemed to be the better option. Westbrook acted like my response to his petulant behaviour was an indictment of my character, conveniently leaving out his own vulgarity towards people such as PZ Myers, with Westbrook quite literally engaging in diaper talk as part of an ad hominem. Just like we saw regarding the blacklisting in the last video, these people don't actually care about these standards outside of using them to put down what they saw as a selfish trans person coming to ruin their special club. And Osa's fans couldn't help but play into that hypocrisy, taking me treating Westbrook and Oates with the respects they'd earned as proof that I was some hyper-aggressive trans fan. You know, in the same way every anti-trans bigger out there does? So I made a post both on my video and to the channel's Facebook page on the 28th of May, stating that I was aware of the increasingly transmisogynistic narratives being called upon to demonise me, and that I had no intention of interacting with Rachel Oates any further. And that was really it for me until September, which, again, we'll cover in the next video. Rachel Oates naturally published her own video, an in-depth response to lies about me, Essence of Four is a Lying Bully on the 29th of May 2019, and I have no issue with her doing so. What I take issue with is the fact that, in the entire 1 hour and 15 minute video, Oates doesn't demonstrate a single lie that I've apparently made about her. All she actually does is read out our interactions, assert that she's supportive of trans people, and conclude from her assertions alone that this proves she cannot be transphobic. Ergo, I'm a liar. Except that's not how any of this works. For a start, I hadn't labelled her transphobic. Hell, I wouldn't label Wood for transphobic in one of my videos until the fifth one trying to get into fix things. And that wouldn't come out until the 22nd of June, a whole three weeks after Oates' video. Then there's the fact that it's not Oates' place to declare herself a trans ally, that is for trans people and trans people alone to do. Yet that's all she does. That, and give Woodford a glowing character testimony based on her supposed allyship. Isn't it interesting how Woodford's open anti-trans stance doesn't implicate her, yet her supposed allyship exonerates him? Just something to think about when it comes to a cries of guilt by association. Though, returning to a failure to, you know, show where I'd lied about her, if you're a fan of hers, then please, watch her video and see for yourself. Timestamp a point in her video, any point that shows her A, quoting what I said, and B, going on to prove me wrong using evidence. And not even asking you to show her demonstrating ill intent on my behalf, merely that she proved me wrong. I can't prove that it's not there outside of playing you her entire 1 hour and 50 minute video, yet if Rachel Oates is everything you believe her to be, providing a timestamp of where she demonstrates such a falsehood shouldn't be that hard to do. You can even create a video highlighting such a segment and she will fucking love you for it. You might even become a part of a inner circle. It's at this point I should probably note that I issued this very same challenge in 2022, and not a single person could do it. Because it doesn't exist. Speaking of actually proving things, this brings us back round to Woodward's continued descent into Transmissia, specifically how he claimed that the issue was just a single video, and thus to condemn him was unfair. 
but this was quickly shown to be false. There was not one, but two other videos in which Woodford engaged in clear anti-trans rhetoric, a fact myself and others quickly pointed out. One of those videos had been Jordan Peterson's Truth Debunked, which Woodford published on the 27th of February 2018, during which he gave the following glowing character review of Peterson during the opening segment. So let me begin by saying that I entirely appreciate why so many venerate and idolise Jordan Peterson, as he's obviously an intelligent and insightful man whose defence of free speech and biological facts has been truly admirable. In fact, it's precisely for these reasons that he has my respect. The phrase, defence of free speech and biological facts, is one that stands out to anyone aware of Jordan Peterson and how he took off. Peterson became famous by declaring his intent to deliberately misgender and harass any students or faculty at the university he works at, claiming said harassment was him defending biological truth as part of free speech. He also lied about the C-16 bill, which simply added trans people to the pre-existing anti-discrimination legislation, arguing that people would be imprisoned for accidental misgendering. This claim was quickly pulled apart by actual lawyers, and the bill passed a full year before Woodford's video, so he knows this is bullshit, but chose to parrot said far-right narrative anyway. And in case there's any doubt left in your mind about the facts that Woodford is supporting Peterson's harassment of trans people, just watch what Woodford had pop up on screen towards the end as he talks about what he admires in Peterson. This sleight of hand comes in extremely useful to apologists such as Peterson, because when he's asked a question to which he has a justifiable answer, such as, is it true that there are only two sexes, he can, and does, answer according to the realist definition of truth. But when he's asked a question to which he doesn't have a justifiable answer, such as, is it true that a literal historical man called Jesus resurrected, he answers according to the Peterson definition of truth which, considering his animosity for postmodernism, is ironically postmodern. It was an annotation, a cutout of Jordan Peterson, with a speech bubble stating that, quote, You're not an Apache helicopter, end quote. The Apache helicopter remark is a far-right meme designed to ridicule trans people, denying them their existence, and by extension, their humanity. To be clear, Woodford took time out of his day to add said visual, as he talks about positions he thinks Jordan Peterson is justified in having. This is not subtle. Yet it continues to get worse, with rationality rules going on to make a similar series of statements about Ben Shapiro in his video, Ben Shapiro Calmly Educated by Stephen Woodford, published on the 25th of February, 2019. Love him or loathe him, I'm sure you'll agree with me when I say that Ben Shapiro is one of the greatest debaters around. He's intelligent, quick-witted, excellent at avoiding distractions, is amply armed with references, and, of course, he wields some fantastic one-liners. When you make a substance illegal, the people who are criminals were criminals before and they're criminals after. Al Capone was not going to turn into a banker after Prohibition ended. Let me ask you this. How, uh, okay, I won't ask you how old. I will ask you how old you are, okay? Because you're young enough that it's probably not insulting to ask you. So. I'm 22, so I'm probably going to be naive, right? No. Why aren't you 60? Why aren't you 60? <laughs> and yet, despite Ben's prowess, I disagree with him on almost every major issue. Sure, I'm with him when he's dispensing unrehearsed emotional college students who embody the regressive left. I'm not denying your humanity if you're a transgender person. I am saying that you are not the sex to which you claim to be. But on most topics, such as politics, abortion and free will, I'm fervently against him. Note the fact that Rationality Rules goes out of his way to inform us that he disagrees with Ben Shapiro on the topic of abortion. Which is important, since all the clips he played save the one about Al Capone, were sourced from a single video titled Ben Shapiro Destroys Transgenderism and Pro-Abortion Arguments. So, if he disagrees with Shapiro on abortion, what part is he agreeing with? Looking at the clips themselves, in spite of Shapiro's protest, his claims that he's not denying you your humanity if you are a transgender person, 
That is exactly what he did. The why aren't you 60 is just another variant of the far right attack helicopter meme shown earlier. Transmisia only has one joke and it was created with the sole intent of denying a trans person their legitimacy. It is an attempt to inflict harm upon said person because their existence as a human being goes against the willfully ignorant perspective held by people such as Shapiro, Peterson, and yes, Woodford. Now, I'd caught the Shapiro one myself in my original video, hence my mention of his soft on Shapiro videos and the unrehearsed emotional college students remark during the section on hemoglobin, and thus I expanded on it in my response to Woodford's ACA video, which was published on the 15th of May. Then, on the 21st of May, someone else made another video including both the Shapiro and the Peterson clips, a video which was quickly shared around the community and was frequently referenced by myself and others. Point is, after the 21st of May, all of the key players, including Rachel Oates, knew Woodford had a history of promoting far-right talking points intended to strip trans people of their humanity. A fact that will come up later. Yet it wasn't just Woodford's past, there was also the way Woodford continued to misrepresent the science on trans athletes going forward, as can be seen in his Mistakes of Many video published on the 28th of May, which attempted to outdo his previous embarrassment regarding haemoglobin. Another of my intellectual mistakes refers to haemoglobin. Did you get that, you unrehearsed emotional college students? Haemoglobin is the number one advantage cis men have over cis women. Well, this is awkward. You see, this is what happens when you attempt a bait and switch, using studies comparing cis women to cis men, rather than cis women to trans women on HRT. You end up talking a load of pure bollocks about haemoglobin being the greatest source of trans woman advantage, only to then discover that haemoglobin counts of trans women are the same as those of cis women. Indeed, my views on haemoglobin were mistaken. You see, I had read a few studies which compared the mean haemoglobin levels of trans women to non-trans women, which indeed are significantly higher. But what those studies didn't make clear, and what I now know, is that while the average trans woman on HRT has greater haemoglobin in their blood than the average non-trans woman, it's still within the typical range of the latter. In hindsight, I should have focused on the aforementioned athletic advantages of muscle mass, height, and muscle fibre type, as HRT doesn't bring these advantages down to the typical range. First thing I'd like to note is the fact that Woodford does not show any evidence for muscle fibre type. That is just a hanging assertion. The second thing I'd like to point out is what Woodford got right, at least to begin with. And that's how he switched from using averages to using range. He not only mentioned the range in regards to haemoglobin, but even went so far as to have an annotation pop up on screen, adding that in relation to the effects of HRT being sufficient, he means it brings said traits, quote, within the typical range of non-trans female athletes, end quote. The reason he did this is because I had explained the fallacy of averages in how sports pre-selects the best of the best in my original video. Insert plain diagram here. And yet, in spite of going out of his way to acknowledge range as the better standard and even animate a little pop-up, when it comes to height, as seen in the table on the left, what he's highlighted is the average with standard deviation, not the range. Woodford doesn't elaborate on this here or in his later video, he doesn't actually show the range and explain why it would justify the exclusion of trans women, he just throws it out there. Now, I'd respond to this at the time by explaining how any standard proposed by Woodford to exclude trans women that would also exclude any number of cis women if applied equally would be inherently discriminatory and could thus be dismissed. Using height as Woodford's trait of choice, I pointed to the existence of Margot Didek, a 7 foot 2 inch basketball player who was allowed to play professional sports until she sadly passed away during childbirth. Ergo, if his proposed standard on height would ban any trans woman under 7 foot 2 inches from playing, that argument can be rejected out of hand 
without further discussion. Yet things only continue to get worse for Woodford as we move on to the second piece of evidence, muscle mass, as seen in the chart on the right, which he took from transsexuals and competitive sports. The top bar highlighted is of trans women on HRT, whilst the bottom bar is of pre-HRT trans men. The pre-HRT trans men have been taken as a substitute for cis women, which is an issue we'll get to with Woodford's next video, but it was at least better than trying to pass off cis men without HRT as trans women with HRT, as he'd done with his first video. With that made clear, let's take a look at the section Woodford has chosen to highlight, namely the circle in the middle and the two whiskers extending from the sides. One can't deny the difference is very distinct, it's very bold. It is, as we say, visually striking. Too bad that's not the range for either group. That would be the bar I've now highlighted in green, and once I do that, suddenly the massive difference vanishes. Almost all trans women fit inside the range being used as a stand-in for cis women, and since that range is only made up of 17 trans men, it's very unlikely that said sample would include the extreme outliers, the Margot Didek of muscle mass, if you will. So I pointed this out in my original response, explaining how Woodford could have been spared the embarrassment had he just bothered to read the chart's annotation. You know, the annotation he displayed fully on screen, repeatedly. Like, Woodford was so sure that he was onto something, that he even annotated himself saying, quote, I'll thoroughly go through all of these studies within my future video, end quote. When he hadn't bothered to read the annotation, he chose to put on screen. Furthermore, he did all of this after I'd already dragged him for his calls to strip trans women of six fundamental human rights on the basis of hemoglobin, which would have made any reasonable person cautious as they went forward. But not Woodford. Oh no. That is how negligent he was being, if not outright deceptive. By the way, Woodford would make no attempt to set the record straight once the error had been pointed out to him, instead focusing on attacking my character. That's not to say he was done, however. Woodford would go on to publish his corrected video, Do Transgender Athletes Have an Unfair Advantage, on the 15th of June, a video that showed us that he hadn't changed at all. The first thing i like to highlight is how he abandoned the standard of range. Just pay close attention to what he says here as he has another annotation appear on screen. When it comes to trans women, however, the TUE situation is reversed. Rather than ensuring that their hormones, or TUE, does not put them above the 100% mark, we need to ensure that their TUE brings them down to or below the 100% mark. And until we can show this to be the case, we have not fulfilled our burden of proof. The annotation reads, quote, To be clear, by 100% I mean what they would have been if they had not received male puberty, end quote, which completely contradicts the previous standard Woodford had agreed to, that is, quote, within the typical range of non-trans female athletes, end quote. Which raises the question, why did Woodford choose to change the standard we'd both previously agreed to? Well, I think the answer comes to us when we take a closer look at the standard. There is no way to measure how a trans woman who went through natal puberty would have been had she not done so. Puberty is not only a very complex biological process, it is also a highly individualistic thing, with no two people having the exact same experience, not even twins. That makes it impossible to test for whether HRT lives up to Woodford's new standard, effectively locking trans women out of women's sports, because we don't know on account of the facts that we can't know. This isn't something we can research to further understand, we can't study alternative timelines, which is exactly why Woodford moved the goalposts. He knows he can't defend his position on the previously agreed grounds or cis female range, so has instead opted to change the rules mid-game, like a child who just cannot face the prospect of losing. 
this right here, making his claims untestable and thus unfalsifiable, is all the evidence you need that Woodford could not defend his position using science, and yet decided to pretend otherwise. This alone is conclusive proof that Woodford was malicious in his calls to strip trans women of six fundamental human rights, and that his corrected video was no better than the original. Facts noted in my response, posted on the 22nd of June. There's also the issue of how Woodford chose to label it as male puberty instead of natal puberty. That is, puberty related to one's birth, i.e. their natural puberty, as opposed to their, in many cases, second or synthetic puberty. This was in spite of the fact that I'd called out this very language in Woodford's first video, and he seemed to change it, as seen in his Mistakes in Many video, in how he referred to cis women as non-trans female athletes, which, whilst not perfect, was a hell of a lot better than the language he went back to here in his corrected video. Yet the embarrassment continues, with Woodford going on to assert the following. But when it comes to the burden of proof in reference to whether or not trans women who transitioned after male puberty have an unfair advantage, I think that it depends on the sport. The limited studies that we do have tell us very clearly that HRT reduces their red blood cell count and haemoglobin to within the range of 46XX women, that it dramatically increases their body fat, and that it significantly reduces their muscle mass. However, these same studies also tell us very clearly that HRT has no effect on their height, width or limb length, very limited to no effect on their heart and lung size, limited effect on their muscle fibre type, and that it actually increases their aerial bone mineral density. Notice how, in spite of once again mentioning the range of 46XX women, none of what Woodford shows even touches on range. The table on height only shows how HRT doesn't affect height, it doesn't compare said height to the range seen in cis women, including people such as Margot Didek, which is a fact I'd already explained by this point, meaning Woodford knew what he displayed was completely worthless in this discussion, yet he chose to do so anyway. Because to him, it wasn't about reaching an evidence-based conclusion, it was about pretending to have reached an evidence-based conclusion. Woodford had gone full young earth creationist by this point, which also explains why none of the studies he referenced even touched on heart size, lung size, and muscle fibre type, facts that were also called out in my response. Yet it gets even worse when we get to Woodford's claims about aerial bone mineral density, taken from preservation of volumetric bone density and geometry in trans women during cross-sex hormone therapy, a prospective observational study, which Let's just read the quote Woodford himself displayed on screen in his video whilst he stated that and that it actually increases their aerial bone mineral density. Woodford displays the abstract's conclusion, which noted that quote, although trans women before cross-sex hormones have a lower aerial bone mineral density and cortical bone size compared with control men, their skeletal status is well preserved during cross-sex hormone treatment despite substantial muscle loss." End quote. All the section he displays on screen in his corrected video tells us is that trans women do not have the same aerial bone mineral density or cortical bone size as cis men BEFORE they have begun HRT. Furthermore, the study also found that whilst they see a slight increase in ABMD in certain sites, said increases not enough to bring them within the typical range for cis men, and certainly not higher than cis men, as Woodford leads his followers to believe, via his omission. What this means is that the very study Woodford referenced clearly highlights how you cannot assume that trans women prior HRT have the same physiological attributes as cis men. That anyone making the argument that trans women are physiologically identical to cis men, is denying the very science we have available. For as much as Woodford and other anti-trans bigots would seek to deny trans people their humanity, our very bones testify to our true nature. That is something I find 
profoundly satisfying and is why this study has gone on to become one of my most valuable resources in the fight against anti-trans bigotry. Now, the paper gives a possible reason for said lower ABMD, and that's differences in socialization between trans girls and cis boys. There are a number of reasons trans girls might be deterred from partaking in sports, discrimination, bullying, and gender dysphoria, to name three. The result of which is that trans girls are more likely to have a sedentary lifestyle, which, turns out, has an impact on bone development. Do you know who else is often excluded from sports and is thus more likely to have a sedentary lifestyle? Cis girls. That is why, from the very beginning, I pointed out that until society tackles its misogyny problem, the assertion that cis women are inherently inferior at sports is akin to the assertion that working-class children are inherently inferior at learning when compared to upper-class children who go to private schools. When you have one group receiving 10 times the funding and being told that they can achieve anything, they're going to do better than those who don't receive said funding and are told they might as well give up. Not because they have an intrinsic biological advantage, but because society is tailored to them every step of the way. Sports are tailored to cis men in the same way that schooling is tailored to upper-class children. All of which goes to show just how bad Woodford was, not just in his past, but in how he continued to bend the science to try and force it to match his preconceived notions in a bid to justify stripping trans women of six fundamental human rights. But it doesn't end there. Woodford also went on to promote Fair Play to Women, an organization with a history of grinning at the prospect of trans women dying from cancers as a result of a uterus transplant. Like, that's not even a joke. In response to someone saying that if said uterus transplants for trans women ever become a thing, she stopped being an organ donor, Fair Play to Women responded with, quote, Won't happen. Matthew Manson's correct. Any potential fetus would invade the host body and proliferate like a thousand cancers. Evil grin. End quote. Do I even have to say how twisted the hate group Woodford chose to promote in his corrected video was. Or are we good? And I know I keep stressing that this was his corrected video, but that's because it's a video Woodford chose to make knowing that he'd be scrutinized for it. He knew he had to land this. Yet he chose to promote a well-known hate group. This was not an accident. This is a choice he made! Much like how the only way someone could have missed all of this is if they'd gone out of their way to avoid it. Which again, is a fact we need to keep in mind when we consider how people, like Rachel Oates, continued to defend Woodford. Because I was not the only one to notice the disconnect between what she was saying about Woodford and what I and others had proven about him using evidence. Which finally brings us to the private emails Rachel Oates published on the 12th of July 2019, almost a month later. Said incident began when Oates posted to Twitter, asking, quote, So, I got a slightly odd email from someone. It feels kind of aggressive. I feel defensive. If I don't share who it's from, is it appropriate to share the email and my response with you guys so I can ask your opinion and get some feedback about the accusations they made about me? End quote. To which her audience reassured her that it was okay, leading to a follow-up post in which she published the private emails alongside the statement that, quote, Okay, thanks guys. So this was the email I got and how I responded. I feel I sound a little bit defensive, but one, I am, and two, I'm genuinely confused. Does anyone else feel this way? And if so, please tell me why. I genuinely don't want anyone feeling like this. End quote. Now, I just want to read you the bulk of the email quickly so that you can see what was said for yourself and just how aggressive it truly was. The email reads, Hello. I rarely contact YouTubers who I plan to make videos about, 
but in this case I want to make an exception. I was going to leave a comment, but I know the chances are small that you'd see it, and, well, to be honest, I don't want to leave myself open to replies from your audience. I've been watching your video, an in-depth response to lies about me, and I've been taking notes. There's a lot I want to ask, but I imagine your time is rather limited, so I've decided to ask only about one of your statements. In your video, you say that you stand with the trans community. You assert over and over that you care about trans people and you are our ally. So I want to hear your thoughts on the matter that I, as a trans person, and a former fan of your work, do not feel safe in your spaces. I want to know your thoughts on the fact that I feel the need to email you because I'm too scared of backlash from your fans if I ask you this question publicly in your comments section. No claims about who you are as a person or your intent. No accusations of transphobia on your part. No claims or accusations against Steve. No lists. No divisions. Just that I'm a trans person and I don't feel safe in your spaces. What are your thoughts on that? Is there anything you would like to do about it? Thank you for your time and your response if you give it. Now, the author, who is a trans guy, goes on to give three additional notes in the form of postscript notes or PSs. The first one is him offering to talk more if she'd be interested. The second is him noting the facts that a couple of Nazis have taken to hanging around her social media, with him being very careful to explain that he's not saying that this was deliberate on Oates' part, but that Oates might want to do some moderating, and so he gives her the tools to do so. He quite literally stated that, quote, I don't believe you're very familiar with that particular corner of the internet, end quote, so he wasn't accusing us of anything, but rather offering her useful information he hoped she'd act upon. The last note is just him apologising for how unwieldy everything had become. This is what Rachel Oates chose to present to her audience as an aggressive trans person. Someone very politely approaching her about his concerns in private. Keep in mind that one of the things Rachel Oates and others like Jimmy Snow and Matt Dillahunty kept having a go at me for was calling Woodford out publicly. A number of people kept telling me I should have handled everything in private rather than making a whole scene out of things, ignoring how, after the ACA incident, I attempted just that, only for Woodford to try and gaslight me. Yet here we see someone doing exactly what they'd asked for contacting her in private, and she not only published said private emails, she still presented this guy as the aggressive trans person, teaching her audience that this is how they should perceive similar criticism. This is made all the worse in how the author repeatedly states that he was afraid of Oates' audience, and a part of her knew that this was wrong. That's why she asked her audience for permission as opposed to, you know, the person who sent the email. She asked her audience so that if I or anyone else spotted this and called her out for it, she could just blame said audience and say, well, they said it was okay. This feeds into a wider problem seen with Rachel Lowe's, and that's her refusal to take personal responsibility unless it's for something positive. Like, she just outright refuses to accept the fact that she has autonomy when it comes to making mistakes, which is why she approaches things in this manner. The fact that she had to stop and ask proves that she already knew she was crossing the line. She just wanted to see if her audience would defend her for it first. So the question here becomes, why? What was she hoping to achieve here? Well, I think it's pretty obvious, giving both the framing and the act itself, in light of the fact that the person was explicitly afraid of her audience. She was setting out to make an example of him. This was a very public display intended to intimidate him and any other trans audience members who might be questioning her behaviour regarding Woodford and the trans community into remaining silent. It doesn't matter that she blocked out his name, she knew he was around and would likely see this, meaning he'd likely see the replies his message had received, the abuse and ridicule that was part of them, and understand that it was targeted at him.
This is just textbook bullying behavior by a massive channel targeted at an audience member. And it is a far fucking cry from the soft image Rachel Oates likes to present herself as. It also acts as a way for Oates to teach her audience how to react to any trans person who dared criticize her. Again, returning to what I said in how she primed her audience to see such criticism as aggressive. Her actions here remind me of blooding the hounds, a horrific practice used by fox hunters to get their dogs ready to tear foxes apart. You see, an adult fox is not without its defenses when it comes to the hounds, leading poorly trained hounds to become injured. So the way these barbaric people reduce that is they scout out fox dens, dig them up, steal any kits, that's baby foxes, and use them as soft targets to teach their dogs to tear apart anything that looks, smells, or tastes like a fox without hesitation. Only difference is, rather than targeting innocent animals, Rachel Oates was targeting innocent people. The author here said he was openly afraid of her audience, meaning she had all the power in this interaction and could potentially scare him into remaining silent. This trans guy was the perfect target for her to blood her audience on, to teach them to attack her trans critics on sight without hesitation. Without stopping to listen to the arguments or evidence, said trans people present. And as we'll see in the next video, she was very successful in doing this, ensuring that she could continue to lie, throwing out the assertion that virtually no trans person has ever criticized me, conveniently leaving out how the few trans people who did were torn apart publicly by her audience. Returning to what I said at the start, this should have been the end for Oates's channel. The extreme level of hostility and disdain on display here, not towards me, but a completely different trans person reaching out to try and help her understand the issue, is completely unacceptable. You do not treat anyone this way, let alone a marginalized member of your audience who is afraid of the community you have built. And it didn't stop with the first email either. Oates kept posting the replies every single time. If you're a member of her audience, even if you're not marginalized, there is absolutely nothing stopping her from doing this to you should you contradict her. What makes you think she won't try turning you into an example for the rest of her audience? Your presence is only tolerated as long as you continue to shower her of praise. The very moment you question her, no matter how lightly, she rushes to frame you as the enemy, someone to attack on sight. Thankfully, this trans man showed a tenacity Oates could not have predicted, finding the strength within him to speak out about what she'd done. I know, because that person was Levi the trans man who would go on to become the editor of this channel. He published an actually in-depth response to Rachel Oates, part 1, on the 26th of December 2019, in which he went over mine and Oates' Twitter interactions and the many issues with Rachel Oates' video. He then followed this up with part 2 on the 30th of December, in which he went into detail regarding the emails. So do check those videos out if you'd like a more fresh out of the oven analysis. Though, one thing I need to be absolutely clear about is the fact that I hadn't talked to Levi and didn't know about his running with Rachel Oates until December of 2019, when someone let me know that he was working on a video about the incident. That was what led me to become his very first follower on Twitter, leading to this rather awkward exchange between the two of us since neither of us knew how to react. I had known about his channel in the most vague sense since he'd done a couple of videos on Woodford that I'd added to my watch later list, yet sadly never got around to actually watching as everything fell apart. He was not someone working alongside me, something Levi himself expressed a desire to speak about, so I hand the mic over to him. Hi everyone. Today I want to talk about a particular narrative Woodford's friends, including Oates, 
pushed throughout 2019 to dismiss any trans person who had a criticism they didn't like. I'm talking, of course, about the narrative that any trans person who took issue with them was brainwashed by the evil EOT, or are shitstirrers like EOT. The fact that I went on to officially join EOT seems like pretty damning proof of that, which is why I feel it's so important to explain how I came to doubt Rachel Oates. I want to begin by pointing out that I wasn't really part of Ethel's audience at the time. I had been aware of Essence of Thought since late in 2018, but before I began following the controversy over Woodford's videos, I only watched Ethel's videos sporadically. I didn't consider myself a supporter or even a fan. I did, however, consider myself a fan of Rachel Oates, and I had been actively watching her videos for a couple of years by that point. In fact, I was heavily biased in favour of Oates. Like many of her fans, I considered her a very kind and compassionate person. I found it difficult to believe that she could ever knowingly do something bigoted, and it didn't even occur to me that she could ever do something cruel. That's why I was immediately sceptical of Ethel's claims about her. Or rather, it was one of the reasons. The other reason was Ethel's copious evidence. Over months of following Ethel's coverage of Woodford's actions, I had become accustomed to seeing proof of everything Ethel claimed right before my eyes. So when I was confronted with some bewildering claims about Oates coupled with a lack of screenshots, I didn't assume that Ethel knew something I didn't or had an experience in private that the rest of us weren't privy to. No, my first impulse was to doubt. My second impulse was to check for myself. I didn't understand how to check Ethel's references at that point, so I went straight to the source and looked at Oates' tweets and her video on Ethel. I don't remember exactly what I found, but I do remember thinking that Ethel had severely understated Oates' actions. It was worse than I could have ever imagined. I decided to reach out to Oates to give her a chance to prove that she hadn't been lying about who she was, and, well, you can read the results for yourself. So, no, I wasn't brainwashed by Ethel. The only thing Ethel indoctrinated me with, through her dedication to fully referencing each of her videos, was the idea that I am owed evidence before I accept someone's claims. Ethel never told me what to believe. My opinions were entirely my own. Contrast that with Oates' video. I remember, when I was cross-referencing her claims with Ethel's statements, that I was using the shirts Ethel was wearing in each of the clips to help me track down the videos they came from. That's how difficult it was for me to check the evidence for myself. For the members of her audience who didn't even know who Ethel was, it would have been nearly impossible. So, with that made clear, let's acknowledge the impact of Oates' argument as it appears in the emails. First and foremost, it strips me of my humanity, my opinions, my decisions, my actions, and my very feelings are all attributed to someone else. No matter how eloquently or passionately I explain myself, I'm treated like a mindless drone, a thing that someone else owns. This is also a form of alienation. I'm not allowed to advocate for my interests as a trans person, and I'm effectively declared less knowledgeable than a cis person on the topics of trans rights and transmisia. When Oates uses this argument, she is putting a wall between me and my lived experiences, saying, no, I will speak for you because you can't be trusted to have the right opinion. As you can imagine, this is a pretty awful situation for me, especially since I already have to deal with this regularly. Autistic people, trans masks, and especially autistic trans masks are often treated as though we can't be trusted to think for ourselves. This is also really awful for Ethel, since her attempts at advocating for trans people are being used as THE reason to dismiss trans people and her traumatic past is used as a justification. Imagine how angry Oates would be if we did that to her. This argument also does very real harm to Ethel specifically. The idea that she is a shitstirrer who's teaching trans people to go after Oates relies heavily on trans misogynistic tropes about trans femmes being violent and dangerous and deserving of violence. I even remember worrying, after the emails were published, that Ethel would be blamed and harassed and harmed for my independent choices and actions. 
Thankfully, that doesn't seem to have happened, but it says a lot about how Woodford, Oates, and their friends and fans operate that it was even a possibility. You simply can't attribute trans people's criticisms of you to a designated evil trans person and still call yourself a trans ally. It's unfair, it's dehumanizing, it's yet another attack on the autonomy of trans people, and it also compounds existing stereotypes of trans masks as vulnerable to malign influences and trans femmes as a duplicitous threat. Back to you, Ethel. We've gone ahead and produced a Google document containing all of the emails so that you can read them for yourself. I will be referencing specific quotes as we go topic to topic, but they're too long and jumbled up to go through line by line, so do check them out to make sure nothing has been taken out of context. With that noted, let's start by discussing the way in which Rachel has tone policed the trans community in 2019, as it most strongly relates to the evidence we went over during the timeline section, particularly the part on Woodford. Said tone policing becomes particularly prominent in her second reply, with Oates asserting that quote, And in this case, I think EOT and a lot of his friends are being immature, reactionary, and attention-seeking. This has become less about correcting some bad signs for them, and more about them wanting to cause outrage, virtue signalling, and attempting to demonise and cancel people who don't agree with them 100%, end quote, before going on to add that quote, but if a person sees someone say something bad or negative and ill-informed, and responds with, well, I hate you and think you're a bad person, and that goes for all of the people you're friends with, and I'm going to start lying about them, gaslighting them, strawmanning them, and spread misinformation about them, and, instead of trying to educate you on your faults, I just want to make everyone else hate you, then I'm not going to stand by and let people think that behaviour is okay. End quote. A sentiment she then reaffirms in her third email, asserting, quote, To clarify, when I said the science, I meant I wanted people to talk about the content of Steve's video, explain where he went wrong and why some of his statements were problematic, not just lash out with name-calling and trying to get his channel cancelled. I thought it was better to educate him on where he went wrong, rather than just attack him as a person, because I still don't think he had bad intentions. I think it's more productive to say, this statement was problematic because blank, rather than Steve is a transphobic piece of crap because he said blank, end quote. In case you're wondering, we will be returning to the far-right language Oates uses, towards the end of the video. Yeah, starting with her claim that myself and others failed or even refused to tackle Woodford on the science, that is just a flat-out lie. As shown in the section about Woodford's continued descent into Transmisia, I continue to point out Woodford's pseudoscience all the way up to his final video, with my response to it going out on the 22nd of June, weeks prior to this exchange. And I was just one person or several doing so. The only way Oates could have missed that is if she was lying about having watched my videos when she comments on said content. Which, if so, isn't my responsibility. I can only assume she has watched the content she claims to. Point is, Woodford wasn't misinformed, he didn't need educating. He was malicious in his production of anti-trans content, a fact Rachel Oates knew and chose to lie about in his defence. As for her claim that I hadn't given Woodford a chance and had just labelled him a transphobe, not only did that ignore how I left the door open to him in my original response, so I expect you to have the decency to do the right thing. Prove me wrong on the alt light remark. Prove to me that you are better than that, because from watching the rest of your video, I really question that. A lot of what is said is not just factually wrong, is unnecessarily hostile and dehumanising towards trans people. But also the fact that I hadn't publicly declared Woodford a transphobe until my fifth video on him, published on the 22nd of June, a whole two and a half months after he'd published his original piece. So I guess that raises two questions. How many chances should I have given Woodford? How many times should I have let him rip into my community? before it would have been okay to label him a bigot. Five? Ten? A hundred times? 
As I see it, no matter how patient I was or how many chances I gave him, it was never going to be enough. That the only acceptable response, at least in the eyes of people like Oates, was for trans people to suffer in silence. Oates wanted what Martin Luther King Jr. referred to as a negative piece, that is, the absence of tension, over a positive piece, which is the presence of justice. She was declaring that, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I can't agree with your methods of direct action. Though putting that aside and pretending, just for a second, like I hadn't given Woodford every reasonable chance to sort out his shit, pretending that I'd come in guns blazing from the very start, that still would have been entirely justified given the situation. Woodford was openly calling for trans women to be stripped of six fundamental human rights on grounds of a topic he couldn't be bothered to research. And that's the best case scenario. Worst case is he maliciously lied from the start. He came after my community. He didn't have to create a video on a topic he knew virtually nothing about. He chose to. He chose to call for trans women to be stripped of fundamental human rights, and he chose to do so under the veneer of science. If a trans person reacts to that with anger, that is completely justified. If a trans person labelled him a bigot, a transphobe, or transmissist right out the gate, that would have been justified. It's not on trans people to regulate their emotions or their language for the comfort of bigots calling for our destruction. If a bigot is made to feel uncomfortable in their bigotry, good! Because as Woodford showed us, both in his history and his behaviour following my initial response, bigots cannot be trusted to do the right thing out of the goodness of their hearts. You have to make them uncomfortable, else they'll grow accustomed to their bigotry, and will take any question or said bigotry as some life-ending phenomenon. The attendance on my life has left me scarred and deformed. Yet the issue goes deeper than that in how it is not trans people's responsibility to educate violent bigots. That when we take time to explain psych, we are already going above and beyond. Let's unpack that very assumption. Oates is demanding labour from trans people that specifically pits them against anti-trans bigots, calling for them to be stripped of fundamental human rights. In doing so, she is demanding that trans people throw themselves upon the bayonets of said bigots, never crying out, never cursing their names, for the possibility that said violent bigots might find some semblance of sympathy, that they might achieve some sort of personal enlightenment. She's demanding that trans people sacrifice their health, their very well-being, for the benefit of anti-trans bigots, that we must mentally mutilate ourselves for them. Rachel Oates treats trans people as disposable by default, that our purpose is to be broken down and burnt up to help fuel the personal growth of cis people. This is a textbook example of objectification, degrading a group of marginalised people to the status of a mere object that is a tool for use. Hey, a quick editor's note here. Something that stuck out to me was the way in which Rachel Oates commented on Levi's follow-up emails, specifically the one shared on the 22nd of July, stating, quote, So I'm back from visiting family, and this is still ongoing, apparently. I got this email, end quote. This is incredibly disrespectful, given what she argued regarding the apparent duty of every trans person to educate everyone else. Levi took time out of his day to try and have a thoughtful interaction with Rachel Oates, and she chose to present that to her audience as a chore, while simultaneously chastising me for apparently not doing the very same thing to Woodford. Not only is this disrespectful of Levi as a person and an audience member, but specifically undercuts her arguments against me as not having any real substance or conviction. Rachel Oates is in love with the idea of marginalised people educating those around them, the aesthetics, the optics. She despises 
the act itself. This right here is a fundamental reason why Rachel Oates could never be a trans ally, at least not with her current mindset. She's more preoccupied with trying to extract as much free labour out of trans people as she can than she is the violence launched at us. Not once did Oates call Woodford out regarding the pseudoscience in his corrected video. Not once did she call out his history of dehumanising trans people in quite literally comparing us to attack helicopters. And it wasn't because she was following my advice and not talking on a topic she knew nothing about, as so many people claimed. Something seen in how she felt more than capable of speaking on that very topic, so long as it was in Woodford's defence, to demand that trans people give endless labour without complaint. Rachel Oates doesn't care about trans people, other than to use them as a way to build a brand that appears inclusive. But Ethel, didn't you split your original video into two sections, the first dealing with the science and the second the humanities? Wasn't that you tone policing yourself? What's the difference? The difference is, I chose to do so for my own safety, because I was fucking terrified. I had gone up against larger members of the SECA community in the past, most notably TJ Kirk, aka The Amazing Atheist, during the height of the Gamergate period. In fact, I'd introduced my current referencing style in my response to Kirk's wage gap video for much the same reason, marking the start of my second generation. I'd seen what the audiences of fragile white men could do, I knew what I was getting into, so I knew I needed to approach things with extreme caution. In Kirk's case, that meant introducing a new referencing style, so nothing could be taken out of context. In Woodford's case, that meant putting my very own humanity on pause as I tackled the science first. And regarding that latter example, I hope it goes without saying just how painful it is to have to feel like you have to do that to deny yourself the very human response of anger as you deal with someone seeking to strip you and your community of their rights. It's one thing for me to make that demand of myself for my safety as a trans person, it's a completely different thing to have a cis person order me as a trans person to do so on grounds that if I don't comply, then my criticism can be ignored. These things are not the same. A fact way too many people seem to have difficulty with. Yet the way Rachel Oates frames things goes beyond simple tone policing. There's this narrative present throughout the exchange in which she falls trans people as overwhelmingly aggressive and malicious. This is seen in the way she accuses us of lashing out being initially rude and hostile, or that we're gossiping, immature, and angry. That we're excluding people because of something they haven't even done. We also saw this in how she referred to Levi's emails as kind of aggressive, when introducing them to her audience, priming said audience to see them in the least charitable light possible. I wish it went without saying that presenting a marginalised group reacting to violence inflicted upon them as unfairly aggressive or malicious is a shitty thing to do, but it seems I have to. And that marks the incredible disparity between how Oates treats Woodford versus the entire trans community. How Woodford has given no end of doubt and support in spite of his repeated calls to strip trans women or six fundamental human rights yet trans people attempting to hold him responsible for said actions are painted as these evil manipulators just out to cause trouble. This also reveals how Oates has inverted the imbalance of power in her cries about attempts to exclude people, ignoring the facts that trans people didn't have that sort of pull in the secular community. We weren't excluding Woodford, we were separating ourselves from him and the people who supported him. We started to create our own spaces, and that's it. And even then we ran the risk of said spaces being overrun and destroyed in a similar fashion to the ACA. So Oates has fundamentally flipped the power dynamic, framing Woodford as the victim acted upon by the evil trans community 
as opposed to a sizable content creator using his platform to encourage anti-trans violence. And all this is bad enough when it's targeted at the trans community in general, but there's this additional layer when we consider how I, Woodford's main critic, am a non-passing trans femme individual. Trans misogyny is the specific form of violence felt by trans femme individuals, and a large portion of that violence is rooted in masculinizing us by presenting us as aggressive brutes. Society has come to associate aggression with masculinity in general, making it one of the easiest ways to delegitimize said trans person's femininity, much in the same way that misogynoir does with black women. This is why the far right has spent so long constructing the image of trans femme folk breaking into bathroom stalls and bellowing down at cis women, because they know it's a relatively easy prejudice to tap into, to get people on their side in supporting violence against all trans people. And that is what Oates is tapping into when she accuses me of lashing out when politely asking her for evidence of her claims and criticizing her refusal to stand with the human rights of trans people. She is openly using trans misogyny to do the heavy lifting to turn her audience against her critics because it's safer for a brand than actually engaging with trans people as human beings, harmed by her friend's actions. And we as trans femme folk are acutely aware of this. I not only held back in my original video regarding the humanities until I dealt with the science, and even then I never allow myself to show my anger, but I kept the Shapiro video separate, only alluding to its very specific context in the statement about unrehearsed emotional college students. I could have very easily used that to show a history of anti-trans rhetoric out the gay, justifying calling Woodford a bigot, but I didn't, because I was worried it would be a step too far for many in Woodford's audience, that it would be taken as undue aggression and cause them to lock down in the same way as a conspiracy theorist. I was made to walk on eggshells because of who I am because I knew the cost of what happens when a trans femme person doesn't do that. I even noted the way Oates and her audience was presenting me as unreasonably aggressive in the post I made to Facebook on the 28th of May, a whole month before her exchange with Levi, in which I stated, quote, Rachel Oates seems to be trying to position herself in the same poor white cis woman that Woodford did with Selena Soul in his original video. And this is all just one more way to distract from the actual issue here. Cries to remove the human rights of trans women and attempts to avoid accountability when such transphobic content is called out. That's why I'm maintaining the block. That's why I will continue to refuse to deal with oats. End quote. So she chose to continue tapping into trans misogyny after I pointed it out. What does that say about her notions of allyship? The fact that Rachel Oates didn't stop to question what she was doing, that she was so ready and willing to use this prejudicial narrative, is in itself an indictment of her character and everything she pretends to be. Actual allies don't go about demonizing marginalized folk for taking a stand against violence levied at them. They instead stand shoulder to shoulder, hand to hand with us in facing down that violence. Yet things only continue to get worse when we acknowledge how, whilst doing this, Rachel Oates resorted to armchair diagnosing me. An armchair diagnosis refers to when someone publicly diagnoses a person they have never treated, stating that said person has mental health issues without having performed a clinical assessment. Note, contrary to popular belief, an armchair diagnosis doesn't stop being an armchair diagnosis if done by professional. All that actually changes is that said professional risk investigation and the potential revoking of their license as armchair diagnoses are a form of medical violence and thus breach medical ethics in many countries. Let me repeat that. If you are a therapist and you make public claims about a person's mental status without first performing an assessment on them and getting their consent to share said assessment, you risk destroying your entire career. This is reflective of how harmful said actions can be. Tying this back to Rachel Oates, 
we have this charming snippet taken from her second reply, in which she asserts, quote, I do think I understand where they're coming from. I even said as much in my video. I think they're lashing out and being reactionary out of fear and seeing everyone as potential threats because of how they might have been treated in the past. And obviously, there's a lot more to it than this, and it's a lot more complex than this. But that's not the point. Understanding someone's behavior and explaining someone's behavior does not excuse it. End quote. So, not only is Rachel Lewis making completely unfounded claims about my history, but she's doing so to argue that my criticisms of her and Woodford have nothing to do with their actions, but is instead misplaced anger resulting from unresolved PTSD. This is stripping me of my autonomy, my will as a human being, by asserting that my actions are the result of distant abuses, rather than conscious decisions. This is an incredibly violent act, being outright dehumanizing, not to mention incredibly ableist. This is the exact same thing that Christian apologists have been saying about atheists for decades now, that we're all atheists, not because we fought out the evidence on God, but because we were abused and thus have daddy issues, leading us to hate God as the ultimate father. They also argue much the same about LGBT plus folk, claiming that of a being LGBT plus, is nothing more than the result of past sexual or domestic abuse. It's also used in rape apologetics. Sexual predators will often downplay their violence, claiming that the issue wasn't their actions, but the fact that their victim likely has a history of sexual abuse, and thus has a warped perspective. Which, given how prevalent sexual violence is, you can see how the odds are stacked in their favor. This is not a good faith argument, Oates isn't speculating about my past to argue for compassion towards me as a victim. She isn't doing so whilst reflecting on how she was needlessly hostile from the start. She's doing so to neuter my criticism of her and Woodford's actions. She is quite literally bringing up potential violence I suffered in the past to condemn me, blaming me, the victim, for the violence this people has supposedly inflicted upon me. She is preemptively victim blaming me. Thing is, even if it were true, even if my views were impacted by past violence, none of that would falsify my or Levi's arguments. It wouldn't make Woodford any less of a bigot, and it wouldn't justify the way she had treated me or the rest of the trans community. In fact, if anything, it'd make my perspective more valid in how I'm someone with experience of anti-trans violence which acts as a very basis for self-advocacy. Returning to the rape culture example, what Rachel Oates is doing here is akin to someone asserting that a rape victim cannot speak impartially on sexual violence and should thus be ignored, or better yet, silenced. The assumption here is that going through such a horrific experience only warps the mind. It doesn't clarify. Her entire argument is antithetical to standpoint feminism and self-advocacy in general, the system by which people impacted by inequality or violence are centered in discussions about said inequality and violence. By Oates' logic, no woman can be a feminist because they're all impacted by misogyny. However, it's not just me that Rachel Oates treats this way as can be seen in her final email in the statement that, quote, I might not be a minority group in society as a whole, but I'm used to feeling unsafe and scared. I'm used to being on the outskirts. I'm used to being badly treated, physically hurt, bullied, and it's not nice, but I also spent a lot of time in counseling, learning I was being angry and scared of the wrong people, end quote. With her going on to add that, quote, Trans people can't just live their life shutting out whole groups of people because there's a chance they might know someone who might do something bad in the future. End quote. Just doubling down on this narrative that the trans community, or at least the portion criticizing Woodford, were only doing so because they've experienced violence, making said criticism, at least in her mind, invalid. She even ended her final response by telling Levi that, quote, I just hope you stop being angry at the world and seeing the entire world as out to get you." End quote. Clearly pigeonholing him in the same way she did me. 
This grotesque display of ableism slash dehumanization is something which, if you follow Oates' channel because she frames herself as a mental health advocate and a feminist, should have you reeling in shock and horror. Even I had no idea as to the true extent of Oates' horrific behaviour until I read these emails. They go a long way in exposing the sort of person she really is. Of course, a major component of tone policing is minimising the violence that provokes their tone. After all, when you say someone got angry at someone hurting them, said tone policing loses a lot of its power. And we see a clear example of such minimising in Oates' second reply to Levi, specifically her assertion that, quote, I think they have every right to criticise the content of Steve's video. I don't think they have a right to start lying about things people have said e.g. me, but also many other people. And while they have a right to do the following, I don't think they're above criticism for continually stirring up outrage and drama over minor issues." End quote. Note the use of minor issues here. This is in spite of the fact that my very first response to Woodford quite literally opened with me listing the six fundamental human rights he was calling for trans women to be stripped of. As a quick recap, those rights were the right to equality and non-discrimination, the right to the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health, the right to sexual and reproductive health, the right to work and to the enjoyment of just and favourable conditions of work, the right to privacy, the right to freedom from torture and other cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment and harmful practices, and full respect for the dignity, bodily integrity, and bodily autonomy of the person. This was the very first thing I established in my original response, that this was nothing less than a human rights issue on multiple levels, before going on to tackle the science. Rachel Oates knew this, and in spite of that, chose to reframe the matter as minor issues. This is direct trivialization of violence against trans people in the removal of those rights, and that's before we even get to the whole tearing apart of the ACA. And this downplaying continued in her second reply, with Oates stating, quote, I don't care who you are, your age, gender identity, race, religion, political beliefs, any of it. You don't get a free pass to act like a child and try and hurt people just because they hurt you. Or in this case, you don't get a free pass to attempt to hurt an entire group of people and ruin their careers because you felt one of them was misinformed." End quote. A sentiment she reaffirmed in her final reply, adding, quote, I thought it was better to educate him on where he went wrong rather than just attack him as a person because I still don't think he had bad intentions." End quote. Oates puts the focus on Woodford's intentions, something nobody but Woodford can be 100% certain of, framing him as misinformed rather than malicious. This was in spite of all evidence at the time showing the exact opposite, a fact that was readily discussed by myself and numerous others. Rachel Oates chose to ignore that opting to assert that Woodford didn't have bad intentions and that he just went wrong. As if repeatedly promoting pseudoscience as justification to strip trans women of fundamental human rights was just a minor issue that had little to no impact. Though it's not just in relation to the human rights of trans women that Oates trivialises anti-trans violence, we also see her taking another crack at the ACA moderators in her second reply, stating, quote, I never told them to grow up for criticising Steve. I told them directly to grow up because they were making lists saying we don't like this person because they're friends with this person we don't like. I had no idea who wrote the list, never mind their gender identity." End quote. Except Oates had already been informed that this was not a blacklist, that it was, in fact, a safety tool created by trans people for trans people that inside a private group of around 20 people, they put together two lists. The first, a list of people who had spoken out about Woodford and were known to be safe, at least regarding this issue, and a list of people known to work closely with Woodford who had yet to say anything in support of the trans community regarding his calls to strip trans women or six fundamental human rights. 
The reason they did this, as we went into detail about in the previous video, was because following secular YouTubers as a trans person during this period felt like playing a game of Russian Roulette. So many people previously thought Safe had come out swinging for Woodford and his calls for violence, and so trans people took steps to protect themselves as best they could, and that was by passing around information. When you can't get justice, keeping your fellow community members safe is the next best thing. Bringing this back around to rape culture, and I know I'm doing this a lot, but I'm kind of banking on the facts that Oates presents herself as a feminist, there is no difference between this list and, say, the list women draw up of known predators on college campuses, as well as those who hang out with and defend said predators. Because yes, who you hang out with and defend is a reflection of what you will tolerate as a person. Add to this the fact that the 20 or so people in that group were specifically the ACA walkouts, mostly moderators, people who had been the target of harassment and abuse launched at them by Woodford and his supporters, abuse so extreme that led many of them to develop mental health issues ranging from insomnia to suicidal ideation, and we begin to see just how grossly insulting this argument is. These people were the victims of extreme violence, in large part thanks to Oates' friend Woodford, and she was ordering them to grow up for taking steps to protect themselves from further violence by no longer engaging with certain YouTubers, literally just withdrawing their support. Everything Rachel Oates says here just reeks of privilege and entitlement. Yet the minimization continues, with Rachel Oates doubling back on a public apology regarding such violence. You see, following her video on me in which she failed to show where I lied about her, someone posted a comment stating, quote, Alright, who's been lying about you and where can I break their knees? Because you deserve far better than baseless lies. End quote. Which she gave a heart to. Oates did this after we'd seen the incredible displays of violence launched at the ACA moderators. This joke about violence towards me, a trans person defending my human rights, didn't exist in a vacuum. I, along with many of my trans siblings, were being attacked daily for our audacity in standing up to Woodford. This comment, whilst clearly a joke, normalized that violence as something to laugh at and by giving it a heart, Oates was encouraging this sort of response. All she was doing was teaching her audience that this is a way to gain her admiration. So I took to Twitter, calling the comment out, prompting Oates to respond with, quote, You know what, actually, I've been defending this for the joke it is, but seriously, since there are some people who see this as inciting violence against people, I'm sorry. Please don't actually hurt anyone. Liking a comment is not my way of endorsing or encouraging violence against anyone, and I'm sorry it seemed that way. It was easy for me to read this as, I am overprotective of you, and laugh at it, but I didn't stop to think how it would seem to other people. End quote. And you know what happened? I never brought it up again. Not even in my defamation, death threats, and Rachel Oates reclaim my voice video, which I thought I had, but it turns out no, I hadn't. I never brought it up again because Oates had apologized and I had bigger issues to deal with, namely Woodford, Westbrook, and Telltale. That's also why I didn't see her publishing Levi's emails. I took steps to avoid her. So, with that noted, you can perhaps imagine my shock when, in trying to make Levi's concerns into a discussion about me in her initial reply, Oates stated, quote, if it's to do with the facts I like to comment where a 14 year old said, who lied about you, I'll break their knees, then I need to remind you that 1. Liking a comment does not mean I agree with everything in the comment. Sometimes it just means I acknowledge that you took the time to share your opinion, even if I disagree with it. Thanks. 2. There have been times when, scrolling through the YouTube Studio app on my phone, I've liked comments by mistake as I scroll. When this happens, sometimes I don't even notice, other times I immediately unlike them, but basically, my liking comments again doesn't mean I fully support everything they say. 3. 
This particular comment was not a threat of violence against a transgender person for being transgender. It was a hyperbolic joke using an old cliché about a person wanting to stand up for someone who's been hurt by someone. I still don't see anything wrong with that." End quote. First, I don't know how she knows the person's age or why that's even relevant to her own actions. Second, notice how she states that a heart doesn't mean she agrees with everything, in spite of the fact that the comment was only two lines long, but then goes on to suggest that she hearted the comment by accident. So which is it? Was it deliberate and she doesn't agree with the entire two lines, or was it an accident? The fact that she can't pick one is just evidence that she's throwing out every excuse she can think of in hopes that one sticks. That she's saying these things not because she genuinely believes them, but because she's hunting for an answer that will get her off the hook. Speaking of, we come to that final line, her admitting that she doesn't think there was anything wrong about favouriting a comment, threatening violence against a trans person, even jokingly, at a time where trans people were being targeted by her friend's audience with extreme violence. Which leaves me wondering, if she didn't understand the issue, why then did she publicly apologise? Well, it's because she only said sorry because she thought it was what was expected of her, not because she genuinely was. That it was a shrewd move intended to protect her brand, her image, and that was it. This is clear evidence that you cannot trust a single thing, Rachel Oates says, especially her apologies. She has the same approach to integrity as the likes of Ben Shapiro, in how it's not about being morally consistent, it's about saying whatever you can to win the discussion then and there. Her words carry no weight because they can be swapped out on a whim. Another thing revealed by this is how, whilst I'd moved on and hadn't said anything about the issue for more than a month, Oates was not over it. She was still seething over the whole thing, leading her to go on a massive rant the moment a completely different trans person questioned the toxicity of her audience, once again centering herself on a matter relating to the human rights of trans people and anti-trans violence. Which brings us around to the way in which Rachel Oates constantly speaks over trans people. For when Levi stated in his opening piece that quote, you say that you stand with the trans community, you say over and over that you care about trans people and you are our ally, end quote. Oates replied with quote, that's because I do stand with the trans community, and while I want to be an ally and make efforts to be, I have never personally labelled myself an ally, I've only been given that label by trans people, end quote. Which is just internally contradictory. She asserts that she's never presented herself as an ally, only having had trans people do so, while simultaneously asserting that she stands with the trans community. You know, as an ally. Just because she stops short of using the word doesn't actually mean anything when she is still presenting herself as being the very definition of that word. Your Honour, I'd just like the record to show that I am not a British person, I am a person born and raised in Britain. Returning to the notion that she stands with the trans community, that's just a straight up lie in how, as shown in the previous video, Oates quite literally refused to stand with the trans community in supporting the six fundamental human rights relating to sport. So she's asserting that she's saying she's demonstrably not, which does reflect on her and the way she perceives trans people. Asserting your allyship to a trans person when you're being criticised for your bad behaviour is like a dude asserting he's a nice guy to a woman who just rejected him. It's a massive red flag in that it shows said person believes they have the right to dictate your very perception of them, usually into receiving some sort of praise or reward. This behaviour would continue, with Oates doubling down in her second reply, asserting that, quote, I've spoken out as an advocate for transgender people so many times and will continue to do so. I've consistently encouraged people to stand up for themselves and speak out when they're being hurt by people, and I'm going to encourage everyone to do the same. End quote. 
This was in spite of the fact that she was demonising trans people for standing up to Woodford's calls to violence. So no, she very clearly doesn't advocate for trans people speaking up when they're being heard. But she just keeps asserting that she supports us, hoping to drill it into Levi, who is having none of it, and calls out her support for trans people as being nothing more than the bare minimum or even damaging, comparing it to All Lives Matter. This clearly hits a nerve, leading Oates to go on an absolute screed in her final reply. She demands to know whether she needs to go through her videos and find examples, which, if she supported us so much, she wouldn't need to. She then remarks about how she'd quote, critiqued and mocked people like Pearls and Laurie Alexander for their archaic views on gender as a binary thing, related only to sex, end quote which is a good example of roundabout transmisia and intermisia in how she's forwarding sex as this strictly binary thing with trans women being sexually male and trans men being sexually female. You know, the very thing I called Woodford out for doing in his first video. This is also an example of her ostensibly opposing transmisia because it benefits her, which she then props up as evidence that she's a trans ally. She then goes on to assert that she's donated to trans charities, which is both unverifiable and doesn't absolve her of her willingness to let trans people be stripped of fundamental human rights. This is then followed up by the claim that she's helped her trans friends, which is just an example of being a friend, not a trans ally. The fact that she throws us out there as something she deserves to be congratulated on draws her friendship to said people into question, asking whether she's actually friends with them, or whether she just sees them as tokens to collect. It's at this point that Oates calls upon a specific experience she had at the Faithless Forum, asserting that, quote, At the Faithless Forum, after my speech, a person came up to me in tears, saying they spent their whole adult life being labelled as the transgender person, and during my speech they finally felt like they were accepted as part of a community that saw them as a whole person. We hugged and talked and it was one of the most important moments of my life. End quote. Which really goes to show just how detached she is. How she congratulates herself for giving off the appearance that she sees trans people as people. Right before she openly refuses to support said trans people's human rights. Rights which, by very definition, affirm their humanity. You can't have it both ways. You can't symbolically claim to support trans people's humanity and then defend your friend who spent literal years denying them that, most recently attacking their human rights. Those things are mutually exclusive. She lastly goes on to talk about how she sends trans people resources when they message her privately, which again, unverifiable and bare minimum. Also, do we really trust her to be able to pick out decent resources considering her perspectives on sex and gender. Suffice to say, none of this actually addresses the issue of how she continued to defend Woodford after I and others had shown the world exactly what he was, a raging anti-trans bigot. Nor does it deal with the way Oates had excused herself from the very same topic when it came to supporting the human rights of trans women. It's all a distraction, a tool designed to bludgeon Levi into submission, so that he sings her praise, when that's not how any of this works. Oates believes that all of these little things, these symbolic gestures, wash away the fact that she refused to stand with the human rights of trans people, and was currently defending a grotesque anti-trans bigot. The fact that she can't get off of her high horse and actually listen, really listen, to what trans people are telling her, is all the evidence I'll ever need to prove that she's not an ally to trans people. That it was all for show. So the last thing we need to go over is the way in which Rachel Oates flirts with far right slash anti-feminism, starting with her language. We see this in her choice of virtue signaling, cancelling, and the way she presents hate speech as free speech. So let's start with her use of virtue signalling, a term that has its origins in Gamergate and the rise of the alt-right online. The term, as the far right claims, 
refers to people outside of a marginalized group using the optics of social justice to raise their personal status among said marginalized groups. An example of virtue signaling is the notion of white knight, a man who rise in to defend women, signaling their virtue as a male feminist in order to raise their status, and, as the narrative goes, to get laid. Again, this is what the far right claimed virtue signaling was, which, if it were true, would actually be a pretty useful term. But that's never how it was used. Instead, it just became a catch-all buzzword used to disparage anyone fighting for equality, including members of the marginalized community themselves. The usage of virtue signaling in this manner presupposes that nobody can really care about human rights for human rights' sake, that everyone has some ulterior motive. And we can see Rachel Oates using it in the exact same way, labeling Woodford's critics, the loudest of whom were trans, as virtue signalers for defending their own human rights. There's no nuance here. It's just a cudgel used to bludgeon trans people over the head with, and that's it. That's how she uses the term, the exact same way the far right does. This has an impact on her audience, no matter how much she'd like to pretend otherwise, signaling to members of the far right that her space is, dare I say it, a safe space for bigotry and intolerance. The same can be said about her usage of cancelling. To cancel someone was an idea that originated from Black Twitter as a way for members of various Black American communities to signal a public withdrawal or support for someone, usually over bigotry or sexual violence, in the way of a boycott. It was a pledge to no longer consume a public figure's media or product, and if Oates was using the word that way, it'd still be questionable as appropriation, but at least it'd be close to what the trans community was doing. Trans people were withdrawing support from Woodford and his supporters because they didn't feel safe. Yet, as we've seen, both throughout this video and the previous one, this is not how Rachel Oates is using the term. She was using it in the sense of deplatforming or excluding Woodford from the secular community as a whole. She was using it in the exact same way the far right does, in sowing fear that if you say a single thing wrong, a marginalized mob will come for you in the night, stealing your tongue and forever silencing you. Which, I hope it goes without saying, is utter and total bullcrap. Marginalized people do not have that sort of power. So Oates is very clearly feeding the narratives the far right and anti-feminists have spent a long time constructing, inviting them into her circles. Which just leaves us with the notion of hate speech as free speech, bringing us full circle to the quote shared at the start, that Oates also feels, quote, like people have a right to free speech, and if they say something crappy, chances are someone somewhere is going to call them out for it, end quote. She goes out of her way to say this, despite being more than happy to weaponize the UK's draconic defamation laws to silence marginalized critics of her behavior. I, of course, understand the limits of free speech and believe my actions here and in my previous videos fall well within them, that I'm merely sharing evidence of Rachel Lewis's actions as part of open criticism, believing her audience has the right to know who they're supporting. But Oz takes a very broad approach to free speech that includes the aforementioned threat of violence and the presence of Nazis on her channel. So when she comes after me for showing evidence of what she did, that tells us something about her priorities. It tells us a lot about who she believes should and should not be allowed to speak, who she views as subhuman by her own declared standard. It also reveals her absolutist, free speech stance to be a total sham. She didn't allow these comments because she genuinely believes people have the right to say whatever they want, she merely called upon that far-right narrative to try and defeat Levi in their discussion, once again harking back to the comment earlier in how she shares key methodological similarities to people such as Ben Shapiro. Yet she didn't just flirt with the far-right and anti-feminism in her language, she did so in who she associated herself with, because yes, who you associate with does reflect on you as a person in what you will tolerate. Guilt by association is an informal fallacy. 
That is, it's not always a fallacy, only being a fallacy under certain contexts. Regarding guilt by association, it can be better described as guilt by spurious, that is, unrelated, association. For example, Jane works for charity. Jane embezzles money from the charity. Ergo, everyone who works for a charity embezzles money from it. There's nothing about the shared trait of working for a charity that makes someone embezzle money. Hence, that's the spurious association. However, if, in the hypothetical, you decided to be friends with Jane and defend her, it would be entirely fair to judge you on that basis since it shows us what you'll tolerate in people. Now, we've already gone over Woodford and his promotion of far-right talking points such as the attack helicopter meme, details Rachel Oates knew about when she defended him to Levi, so I won't go into detail regarding that again. However, Woodford was not the only far-right slash anti-feminist member of her circle during this period. She was also close to Thomas Westbrook, aka Holy Kool-Aid, someone with a very notable perspective on sexual violence. So in 2018, after dozens of women had come forward independently to make sexual harassment allegations against known child rape apologist Lawrence Krauss, Westbrook set out to do everything he could to undermine the credibility of those accusing Krauss. This included pointing out the fact that little fascists had turned one of the accusers, Melody Hensley, into a triggered meme an act which was both misogynistic and ableist. Westbrook argued that someone who is an active target for fascists could not be trusted because they're a target for fascists. He also went after Rebecca Watson, someone who has reached out to for comment by the people investigating the allegations and even published her own video on the topic that is definitely worth the watch even five years later. Westbrook rather desperately accused Watson of instigating Gamergate, you know, the misogyny fueled hate campaign that sought to end the careers of numerous women, particularly women of colour, in the video games industry. The Gamergate Rebecca was in no way involved in. Like, at all. What Westbrook was mistaking Gamergate for was Elevatorgate, the time in 2011 when Rebecca spent 80 seconds on a side note, politely asking strange men not to follow her into an elevator late at night and ask her back to their room for sex after she'd just given a talk on how uncomfortable being sexualized made her feel. You know, these 80 seconds. You were all fantastic and I love talking to you guys. Um, all of you except for the, the one man who um, didn't really grasp, I think, what I was saying on the panel because um, at the bar later that night, actually at four in the morning, um, we were at the hotel bar, 4 a.m. I said, you know, I've had enough guys, I'm exhausted, go into bed. Uh, so I walked to the elevator and a man got on the elevator with me and said, don't take this the wrong way, but I find you very interesting and I would like to talk more. Would you like to come to my hotel room for coffee? Um, just a word to the wise here, guys, uh, don't do that. Um, you know, <laughs> uh, I don't really know how else to explain how this makes me incredibly uncomfortable, but I'll just sort of lay it out that I was a single woman, you know, in a foreign country at 4 a.m. in a hotel elevator with you, just you, and I don't invite me back to your hotel room <laughs> right after I finished talking about how it creeps me out and makes me uncomfortable when men sexualize me in that manner. So, yeah. Um, but everybody else seemed to really get it, and, and thank you for, for getting it. Which, of course, makes it entirely her fault when misogynistic men rose up en masse to try and force her into silence, lying about what she said in order to present her as some big threat to the secular community. Wait, why does that sound so familiar? Not that any of this matters to the veracity of the accusations made against Krauss, but it reveals Westbrook's habit of poisoning the well against those seeking accountability and justice. He wasn't reserving judgement as he repeatedly asserted in his post. Westbrook had already cast judgement on those making the accusations against a hero of his, 
and thus took to attacking their character. He also attacked their memories, promoting false memory syndrome, a pseudoscientific phenomenon invented by Elizabeth Loftus, which has never been replicated in peer-reviewed studies, yet was heavily promoted by the Catholic Church. You know, THE Catholic Church. They even assigned Paul McHugh, a devout Catholic and board member of the False Memory Syndrome Foundation, to investigate church abuse in 2002, a move which was rightly condemned for destroying any chance of impartiality. That is the pseudoscience Westbrook openly promoted, going so far as to mention Loftus by name, the very same pseudoscience turned to by the Catholic Church to deny their history of sexual violence by attacking the memories of thousands upon thousands of victims. He also downplays sexual violence, going so far as to rely on a personal anecdote to mock the idea that sexual harassment and even assault can have a long-lasting impact on the victim and should therefore come with any sort of repercussions, all of which was carefully designed to feed off pre-existing rape culture. As for defending a known child rape apologist, Lawrence Krauss published an article defending Jeffrey Epstein in 2011, three years after the monster had already pleaded guilty to raping a 14-year-old girl, a fact that was reported on at the time by none other than Rebecca Watson. But instead of humbling himself and learning a thing or two about integrity from Rebecca, Westbrook chose to demonize her for events she had no part in causing. Anything to save his child rape apologist of a hero from scrutiny. Just as Krauss scratched Epstein's back, Westbrook scratched Krauss's back, creating a human centipede of abusers defending abusers. This is someone Rachel Oates felt comfortable being close with as a self-declared feminist, someone with a long and sordid history of anti-feminism, attacking victims, and hero worship of known child rape apologists. And by doing so, by supporting him, and even defending him, as we'll see in the next video regarding the fetal incident, Oates was offering Westbrook an air of legitimacy. After all, Oates is a feminist, Oates supports Westbrook, therefore how can Westbrook be anti-feminist? Abusers defending abusers. It's the exact same method used by Oates in her defense of Woodford. Oates is a trans ally, Oates supports Woodford, therefore how can Woodford be anti-trans? Except, as we all know, the mere assertion that one is a feminist or a trans ally is just that, an assertion in need of evidence via action to support it. Something Oates can't supply. Because this wouldn't be the last time Oates was seen publicly cozying up to and even promoting far-right slash anti-feminist figures, something we'll get to not in the next video, but the video after that. And with that said, I think it's finally over. This has been an absolute marathon of a video, easily the longest I've ever done, excluding live streams. But it was necessary in order to give you full context on Oates' claims throughout her emails. Not to say that there isn't other stuff to touch on, but there's only so much I can do, so I had to prioritize some stuff. Though what do you think? Was there anything you noticed in the emails that you wish I'd discussed? Is it okay for cis people to demand trans people educate anti-trans bigots? Did I jump the gun in calling Woodford a transphobe in my fifth video? Did I show you anything that surprised you? Have you changed your mind about anything after watching this video? Did you notice something I missed? If so, be sure to let me know down below. And if you appreciate what we do here and want to help out, please consider becoming one of our wonderful patrons who make our work possible. On that note, we'd just like to thank the following people. Matthew Kovac, Gerrit Van Voorst, Hannah Banghart, Marble Wings, Sosh Daniels, Flynn, Darnit Dante, and Higgins the Seagull. And for myself, Adita and Levi, take care now.